This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be more about binary quadratic forms. So we recall that a binary quadratic form is something of the form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared. So binary means there are two variables x and y, and quadratic means it has degree 2. And we want to be able to solve this equation, given a, b, c, and n as integers, we want to find x and y solving this. For example, last lecture we discussed the equation x squared minus 67 y squared equals 1 and showed how we could find some non-trivial solutions of this, apart from the trivial solution where y is 0. Um, well, before solving it over the integers, we should first just recall what happens over the complex numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared equals 0 over the complex numbers. And obviously we want a solution with x and y non-zero, otherwise it's kind of boring. And if we divide by y squared, we find ax over y squared plus bx over y plus c equals 0. And this is just a quadratic equation in x and y. And we all know how to solve that by completing the square. We find the formula x over y is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Now, this term b squared minus 4ac here is called the discriminant, and it very much determines the behaviour of this form over not only over the complex numbers, but also over the integers. Um, so we normally denote it by d, so d is b squared minus 4ac. And we note that the behaviour of this depends on the sign of the discriminant. So if d is greater than 0, the roots x over y are real and distinct. If d is equal to 0, the roots are equal. And if d is less than 0, the roots are non-real because we're taking the square root of a, of a negative real number, so we necessarily get a, um, some multiple of i in there. Um, the case when d equals 0 is kind of boring. Um, it's, it's sort of trivial to find integer solutions. So we, we generally sort of ignore this case. Um, um, and... Um, um, we can ask, what are the possible values of d? So what are the possible values? And we notice that d is equal to b squared minus 4ac. So in particular, d is congruent to b squared modulo 4. So um, b squared modulo 4 can only be 0 or 1. So this implies that d must actually be congruent to 0 or 1 modulo 4. So not all integers can appear as the discriminant of a binary quadratic form. Um, conversely, if d satisfies this condition, there's always a form um, with that discriminant. For example, x squared minus ny squared has discriminant d is equal to 4n, and x squared plus xy minus ny squared has discriminant d equals 4n plus 1. So for any number of the form 4n or 4n plus 1, there's at least one binary quadratic form with that discriminant. So the possible discriminants so, are, you know, minus 12, minus 11, minus 8, minus 7, minus 4, minus 3, 0, 1, 4, 5, and so on. And these numbers also turned up when we were discussing the Kronecker symbol. Um, you remember there was a Kronecker symbol, um, d over b, and we point out the Kronecker symbol actually behaves rather better when the when the numerator is 0 or 1 mod 4. And the numerator in the Kronecker symbol is very often taken to be the, the discriminant of some binary quadratic form. And so it's very nice that um, binary quadratic forms will always have discriminants satisfying this condition because that makes the Kronecker symbol very nice. Um, so um, let's look at what effect the discriminant has on the behaviour of the form. So let's look at three forms as examples. So there's x squared plus y squared, x squared minus 2y squared, and minus x squared minus 2y squared. And here 
the discriminant is minus 4, the discriminant is 8, and the discriminant here is minus 8. And you'll notice this is less than 0, this is greater than 0, and this is less than 0. Um, and now we can see that um, these forms have the following properties. This one is always greater than or equal to 0, and this one is always less than or equal to 0. On the other hand, this one here is a bit different because this one can be greater than zero and it can also be less than zero. So um, the, the cases when the form is always either positive or negative, the form is said to be definite. So it's always either definitely positive or definitely negative. And the case when D is less, it can, can, when the form can be both positive positive or negative is called indefinite. And there are two sorts of definite forms. They can either be positive definite when the, the, the value of the form is always positive or they can be negative definite. But there's not really that much difference between positive definite and negative definite forms because you can just change one to the other by multiplying it by minus one. So usually people only discuss positive definite forms because negative definite is a trivial variation of this. And definite forms correspond to D being less than zero, and indefinite forms correspond to D being greater than zero. We're ignoring the case when D equals zero because that's that's kind of trivial. Um, so um, in order to in order to see this, all you have to do is complete the square of the form. What you do is you notice if you've got a form ax squared plus bxy cy squared and you change x to x plus ky the discriminant d remains unchanged it's a, it's a sort of straightforward piece of algebra um, you just have to work at b squared minus 4ac for the for the two forms um, now by by choosing a suitable value of k you can arrange for the um, value of b to be equal to zero. So we only have to check this for the form ax squared plus cy squared. And now you notice the discriminant is minus 4ac. So if this is greater than zero, then that means that um, one of ac is greater than zero and one is less than zero. So this means the form is indefinite. Um, on the other hand, if D is less than zero, this means A and, and, and C are both greater than zero, or A and C are both less than zero. And both of these cases correspond to the form being definite. Of, of course, the first one, the form is positive definite, and the next one, the form is negative definite. But the, the discriminant can't tell the difference between positive definite and negative definite. So the discriminant is called the discriminant because it discriminates between the two cases when, when the form is definite or, or when it's indefinite. And, and the theory of these two forms turns out to be um, quite different. Um, um, for instance, you can see this if you um, try and draw the graph of the form being equal to some constant. So if the form is definite, the, the, the equation of x squared plus y squared equals constant is going to be some sort of ellipse. In fact, it will be a circle in this case. Whereas in the indefinite case, the, 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 the um, x squared minus 2y squared equals a constant is usually a hyperbola unless it degenerates into two straight lines or something. So Definite forms correspond to ellipses, and indefinite forms correspond to hyperbolas. Um, next, we are going to say that ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared equals n. We'll say the form um, represents n. So it just means n is one of the values. Uh, of course, x and y have to be integers. Um, and there's a small technical variation of this. We say it primitively represents um, um, n if x and y are co-prime. We'll see in a few minutes why we need this condition. Um, 
Before then, I'll just give a few examples of this. So the form x squared plus y squared represents 5, because 5 is equal to um, 1 squared plus 2 squared, and this is primitive, because um, 1 and 2 are co-prime. Um, x squared plus y squared does not represent minus 1. Rather, obviously, you can't write minus 1 is the square of some integer plus the square of some other integer, because this is always positive. Um, but x squared plus y squared also represents 8, because 8 is equal to 2 squared plus 2 squared. And you notice this representation is not primitive. In fact, there's no way for x squared plus y squared to represent 8 primitively, as you can easily check. If you, if you write 8 as the sum of two squares, this, the, 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 then the two squares have to be both have to be 4, and this has to be plus or minus 2, and so on. Um, if you look at the form x squared plus 4y squared, this represents 8. Um, so it represents 4 in two ways. We can write 4 is equal to 2 squared plus 4 times 1, 4 times 0 squared. And this is not primitive, because 2 and 0 are not co-prime. But we can also write 4 is equal to 0 squared plus uh, 4 times 1 squared. And this is primitive. So the same number can be represented by form in both a primitive way and an imprimitive way. Um, now we come um, to the main reason why we've introduced the concept of primitive representations. We have the following theorem. So if n is primitively represented um, by ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared with discriminant d is b squared minus 4ac as usual, then d is a square modulo 4n. Um, and before proving this, um, let's just show that we really do need this condition about being primitively represented. Um, it really becomes false if we drop this. Suppose we take the form to be x squared plus y squared, and we take n to be 8 then n is represented because n is equal to 2 squared plus 2 squared. So that's of that form. But uh, d equals minus 4 is not the square mod 4n, which is 32. And we can see that because if minus 4 is equal to b squared plus, uh, better not use b, um, minus 4 is equal to z squared plus 32 times um, some number t, then if we look at this, that's even, that's even, so z must be even, so we can divide z by 2 and we find minus 1 is equal to z over 2 squared plus um, 8t. But this says that minus 1 is a square modulo 8, and we know that minus 1 is not a square modulo 8, so this fails. So without this condition here, this theorem is, 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 is definitely false. So let's see how to prove it. Um, well, the proof is very short. It's a little bit tricky. So suppose n is primitively represented by this form. So n is equal to ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared and x and y co-prime. So we're trying to show that um, d is a square modulo 4n. Well, now we multiply this by 4a. And we get 4an is equal to 4a squared x squared plus 4ab xy plus 4acy squared. And now we're going to complete the square. So this is 2ax plus by squared minus b squared minus 4ac times y squared, which is equal to some square. Min, um, minus dy squared. So dy squared is a square 
modulo 4n, because there we have dy squared is a square, modulo 4n. Um, also, um, dx squared is a square, mod 4n, because x and y are kind of symmetric. Anything we can do with x, we can we can do with y just by just just by switching x and y. So far, we haven't used the fact that x and y are co-prime. But now, what we're going to do is we can put 4n is equal to n1 um, n2 with n1 x uh, n1 and x co-prime and n2 and y co-prime. And in order to do this, we need to use the fact that x and y co-prime. Um, and um, we're also going to take um, n1, n2 uh, to be co-prime with each other. Um, so um, now we notice that x squared d is a square modulo n1 because n1 divides 4n. So d is a square modulo n1 because um, x um, x uh, n1 is equal to 1 so um, we can um, if um, x squared is the square of an invertible element so if x squared d is a square then then, then d is also a square we can just divide by by x squared so, um, also by the same argument d is a square modulo n2, because as we said, it's anything we can do with x, we can do with y. So by the Chinese remainder theorem, d is a square modulo n1 times n2, which is equal to 4n, because n1 and n2 are co-prime. So that's shown that d is a square modulo 4n if it's primitively represented. Now we can ask, is there a converse to this? So we can ask, is there a converse? Um, if d is a square modulo 4n, um, is n represented primitively? And the answer is no, in general. Let's have an example. Let's take the form to be x squared plus 5y squared. So discriminant is minus 20, and d equals minus 20 is a square modulo 4 times 3. So we're going to take n to be 3. But um, x squared plus 5y squared does not represent n. Actually, there's a trivial reason why this could fail. Um, the form could be definite, say the form could be positive definite, and n might be negative. But this shows that even if we don't have this sign condition, here n is positive and the form is positive definite, but um, n is still not represented by the form. However, there's a weak converse. Um, um, the weak converse is equivalent, so if d is a square modulo 4n, then n is primitively represented by some form of discriminant d. And that's very easy because d is a square modulo 4n. That means d is equal to a square minus 4n times something. So, so th this just says d is a square modulo 4n. But then we can take the form to be ax squared plus bxy plus ny squared. And we see this, the discriminant of this form is just b squared minus 4an, which is, which is what we wrote down there. And this represents n. Well, it's obvious how it represents n. We just put x equals 0, y equals 1. And this is certainly primitive because um, 0 and 1 are co-prime. So we have the following very important basic result. So the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, 
D is a square modulo 4n. And secondly, n is primitively represented by some form of discriminant D. Um, so we're going to use this quite a lot. You see, it gives us some information about which numbers are represented by forms. There's a little bit of a problem because we can't, don't seem to be able to pin down exactly which form n is being represented by, but we'll see how to deal with this problem later on. Um, let's just give an example. Let's take d equals minus 4, and let's take n to be a prime because it turns out that primes are rather easier to deal with. Now, there's a form of discriminant d equals minus 4, which is x squared plus y squared. So this theorem says that um, if p is represented by this form, then this implies that d is a square modulo um, 4n, um, which is equal to 4p, because n is just equal to p. So this says that minus 4 is a square modulo 4p, and it's certainly a square modulo 4, so this is equivalent to saying that minus 1 is a square modulo p, and we saw earlier that this is equivalent to saying p equals 2, or p is equivalent to 1 modulo 4. So this says that if x squared plus y squared is p, then p is 1 modulo 4, which we actually saw earlier. It's actually rather easier to prove this. But so, so this is so the fact that any prime of the form x squared plus y squared is a, of the form 1 mod 4 is a special case of this result here. Um, we'd also like the to show the converse. If p is 1 mod 4, we would like to show it's the sum of two squares. Now, if this were the only form of discriminant minus 4, then this theorem would give us that result because it says that, that, that there's some form representing p and it would have to be this form. The trouble is this is far from being the only form of discriminant minus 4. There are loads of other forms. For example, there's x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared and lots and lots of others. However, the key point is that these are all equivalent. So we will explain what equivalent means in a later lecture. But in particular, two equivalent forms represent the same numbers. I should say they're, they're equivalent by their positive definite. Um, so if all positive definite forms of discriminant D are equivalent, then um, if um, n satisfies this condition, then n must be primitively represented by all these forms because it must be primitively represented by one of them and they all represent the same numbers. So if we can show that all positive definite forms of given discriminant are equivalent, then we can use this theorem to show which numbers are represented by the form. Okay, well, um, we now need to discuss what it means for two forms to be equivalent, which I will do in the next lecture.